Good afternoon. Um, as the introduction says, this afternoon I'd like to talk about going beyond Earth and using additive manufacturing to take us to new worlds. So I thought that I'd look at space by theme. When we look at space, it's actually quite easy to say, well, actually, space is just space. Space is satellites, space is rockets, space is space stations, or perhaps, for some of you, space is going beyond Earth, going to the planets and beyond. So looking at space, how do we break it down? Well, we have terrestrial infrastructure, so ground-based space systems. So that might be ground stations, that might be satellite, um, Earth stations, it might be telescope arrays. Then, naturally, we have launch systems, which I think when we say space, most people automatically assume that space is linked to rockets or is linked to spacecraft, hence orbital spacecraft. After that, space stations. I suspect everyone in here is familiar with at least the International Space Station. For those of you who are slightly older, you probably remember the earlier stations like Mir, Skylab, and some of the um, earlier Russian platforms. Luna comes next, that being our moon, just to clarify. Um, I will try and stay away from three-letter acronyms, but I have a tendency as an engineer to do so, but NEO, Near Earth Object. So something in the vicinity of the Earth, but not necessarily going to the inner planets, and not necessarily going to the outer planets. Moving on to the other planets, and by that I specifically mean Mars, um, and to an extent the outer planets, and then finally beyond Sol, beyond our solar system, where else might we go? So one of the really interesting things about space is the design philosophy behind it. And it's where additive is actually really beginning to show us the potential of what we can actually do. When you think of spacecraft, most people, if I asked any of you to draw a spacecraft or draw a rocket, if you draw a rocket, it's probably going to be a tall cylinder pointy thing with a cone on the top. If you draw a satellite, it's almost certainly going to be a box, maybe with solar panels coming out of it, maybe with some form of antenna. But that's typically how we think of spacecraft. Why do we think of spacecraft like that? Well, it's very um, simple, really. It's based on the fact that you make what you can launch, you make what you can build. And what does additive allow us to do? Us? Uh, additive allows us to change the structure. So additive allows us to put the function before, effectively, the shape. And if we look at design philosophy, for example, for lunar exploration, you can see that broadly every single one of those spacecraft on landers all resemble more or less the same. They're square boxes with extrusions coming out of them because they're easy to build, they're easy to assemble, and they're easy to launch. So why do we want to use AM for space? There are plenty of other techniques out there that we can use for manufacturing. And I should caveat that is, additive is good for space, but of course it's not the only technique. There are other techniques of manufacturing that we will use and we will continue to use in the future. Additive is merely an enabling tool which we can use. And one of the reasons we can use that, and it sits so well in the space thematic area, is that we can look at, um, for example, reduction and distribution of mass. Mass basically means cost. The more something weighs, the more it costs to go into space, at least until we have alternative means to conventional launchers. Structurally, we can make materials stiffer, stronger, lighter, and we can completely change the topology. Again, additive as a net shape engineering process is ideal for that. The thermal control high resistance to thermal shock. Space is a harsh environment. It's cold, but it can equally be hot. The pressures vary greatly. They can be intense on some planets. They can be down to effectively um, almost zero pressure in other environments. Space is a near vacuum. It's not a complete vacuum, but it's not very forgiving. So thermal control of materials is actually very, very desirable. Cost, naturally, lower costs. Um, additive isn't necessarily something that we would consider a low cost technique. But it is a process that when we look at it from the start of the life cycle all the way to the conclusion that we can actually reduce the overall cost of ownership. And again, if you look at it from the perspective of keeping something on the shelf, additive actually fits very well, particularly for remote outstations. You can do that right now on frigates in the sea or um, for distant military outposts. Imagine distant, distant outposts being on the moon. Keep the material that you need for the application that you want. And then finally, complexity. As always, the reductions of seams and welds and joins is highly attractive, particularly from a space perspective. Every time you launch something with an additional join, an additional weld, an additional seam, you are inviting failure. Remove those joins and you reduce and mitigate the risk of something failing. So I considered 
this, these slides that I, when I was reviewing these um, last night, do I use these? One of the problems I find with additive is what additive pro won't do is increasingly changing to what additive, oh actually we, that's already happened. And there's a probability in the next three images I show you that someone in here will say, well hang on actually, we're already doing that, or actually we did that last year. So please take this with um, a sense of um, humour that I do not believe that any time in the near future, based on the laws of physics, we're going to be seeing additive creating very small um, systems which are going to be moving through your blood system. Um, broadly, that, the physics doesn't permit us to do that. I'm sure that there will be techniques which allow us to do things with cells, but not in the same way. Likewise, I don't believe we're going to see self-assembly of materials from looking at a liquid to assembling a compl complex assembly. Now, yes, there are manufacturing techniques which allow us to start to build complex multi-component assemblies, but for the most part, I don't believe any of us are going to see, certainly within the next decade, an iPad, for example, being assembled simultaneously in one system or just appearing out of a puddle of liquid metal. While a very attractive, I suspect still rather improbable. And then finally, I equally think it is highly unlikely that we're going to be seeing any time in the future anything which is resembles a replicator, perhaps, which and a dereplicator, where you can take the things you don't want, so the clothes you don't want from last year, the phone you didn't want from last year, and the gifts that your husband gave to you last year, and you can convert them into the thing that you really want by disassembling them and reassembling them at a molecular level. I do not believe additive has that capability. I could be wrong, and if someone wants to tell me in here they've already done that, I'd be very pleased to hear that and delete this slide. So, terrestrial infrastructure. Applications, as I've said, ground stations, telescopes, launch structures. These are big structures, typically on the ground, which right now are not inherently complex, but they are large. But equally, they are ideal for where we can apply additive in terms of making big structures. You'll all be reasonably familiar with using FDM to build buildings, where we're using extruding concrete or other similar materials. There's no reason that for actually very complex structures, we can't do the same for ground-based, say, telescopes. Um, at the moment, we're beginning to see additive certainly used in cryostat and cryogenic components. I think this is an untapped market. So for any of you and experts um, in terms of metals and um, ceramics, I would say cryogenics is one of those really interesting areas which right now additive has barely touched. And I think it's a very interesting opportunity to look at. Um, in the future, though, I think we're going to be seeing light weighting of structures. So some of the big mirrors, for example, um, the one on the James Webb Space Telescope, admittedly an orbital spacecraft, enormous mirrors. To build the next generation of mirror, it's going to be almost certainly bordering on the impossible to launch it. It will have to be assembled in space. But if you look to the image at the bottom of the screen, um, showing the scale, the image on the left-hand side is the European Extremely Large Telescope. This is currently being assembled on a mountain in Chile. In order to build it, they have to blow the top of the mountain off. It's enormous. You can see by scale um, the um, Roman Colosseum on the far right-hand side. It's phenomenally large. If you can build structures in remote environments which uses processes which use fewer materials or make the ease of transfer of that material, then you clearly have an advantage from a construction perspective. So that's clearly one area where additive at the large scale can probably play a part. Launch systems. So by this, I mean multi-stage to orbit. The Space Shuttle, for example, is a multi-stage to orbit. Uh, space planes. Um, air launch systems, very much in vogue at the moment. I think every, probably every other month, we see a new company which is proposing a new way of making rockets. Certainly the rocket company using the Electron rocket system and um, launching from New Zealand is very successfully using a uh, metal AM platform to manufacture their rocket engines. And of course, we've all heard in terms of what SpaceX are doing with their platforms. But right now, we are also seeing a lot of environmental components of launch systems. The United Launch Alliance, <coughs> excuse me, the United Launch Alliance is using Oltem, um, a material which many of the machines outside are manufacturing, to manufacture environmental cooling systems. And that's a simplification. That's a reduction of complexity of, say, 20 to 30 components into one to build one large cooling comp component, which, as I said, if you can reduce the number of those joints and seams, you reduce the risk of a component failing during launch. So hugely attractive. And then moving into the future, almost certainly we're going to start seeing um, the use of printed rocket fuels. In a way, it sounds a little bit unbelievable. Um, at the bottom, of, um, the image is a rocket engine manufactured by the Aerospace Corporation in an ABS. And the double helix running through it allows you to accelerate the burn time. 
Um, what I find really interesting is um, when you look at space, for the most part, generally, if you're an internet billionaire, you've got a pretty good chance of building a rocket and launching something. If you're everybody else, it's actually quite hard. This company um, called uh, Stofel Aerospace, based in the US and St. Louis, um, they're building rocket engines on the equivalent to an ultimaker. Um, I'm not sure they'll share the designs with you per se, but they're basically printing PLA rocket engines and then, then launching them on a balloon um, in a system known as a raccoon, basically a balloon launched rocket, um, not launching furry animals, certainly. Um, and they're actually achieving um, altitudes of in excess of 100,000 feet. But the really interesting thing is that this very small team, it's literally um, a guy and his daughter building these, um, they're building these engines for about $100 a shot. When you compare that to the conventional cost of building a rocket system, even a small rocket system, it really just changed the paradigm that space is expensive and it's not for everybody. Orbital spacecraft, satellites, telecommunications, Earth observation. The applications are diverse um, and they will continue to be diverse as we start to see constellations so not just tens of satellites going up, but thousands of satellites being launched over the next decade, then we're going to start seeing additive being used, in, used increasingly. Um, not just in terms of things like antenna standoffs, which sound fairly obvious, but also looking at support structures, looking at environmental ducting, and then looking at maybe um, propulsion systems, electric propulsion as well as chemical propulsion, looking at energy recovery. I go back to my point about cryogenics. If you can remove the heat from a structure, how about looking at the hot side and the cold side of a spacecraft? Can you extract useful work energy out of the middle? And if so, can you do something with that work energy? If you can, that means less electrical power you need on your spacecraft and thus the ability to do more. Functionally graded materials are a really interesting area to look at in that respect. If you look at a typical spacecraft, and I, this is a, a very generalized typical spacecraft, the interesting aspect is that um, the third highest percentage after power and payload is usually structure. So if you can do something interesting with structure, and for example, looking at a functionally graded material, where on one side you have a high wear resistant material, so it offers you protection from micrometeorite impacts or launch conditions. On the inside, you then have thermal properties which allow you to protect the sensitive payloads inside the spacecraft. And then maybe if you can do something in the middle of it, as I said about the cryogenics, then you might be able to do something in terms of extracting energy out of that. That really changes how you change the structure of a spacecraft which means the future spacecraft we launch may no longer look like rectangle fridges, they may look like something completely different. Space stations, right now we've only got one. I suspect within the next five years we're almost certainly going to see one of the first commercial um, space stations launched, if not seeing something like the Bigelow um, inflatable air module, which is already attached to the space station, though not completely inflated. We're going to start seeing more space stations launched, not just for science, not just for um, uh, effectively looking um, out towards the planets and not just for exploration, but also looking towards the ability of what can we manufacture in space? Can we make things in space more effectively? So for example, if you look at an alloy, for example, um, can you call an alloy down? Can you manufacture it in a low gravity so you can incorporate air pockets, um, effectively making, say, a titanium, um, inherently very strong, but make it even lighter by incorporation of air pockets within it. Cool it down, use a microgravity to create um, bubbles in it, and you end up with a type of porous sandwich. You may be able to make materials in space but that we can't manufacture on Earth. And suddenly, if we can do that, we can actually start to make space commercially viable. Because the only way we're going to actually leave this planet successfully is if someone can say, I can make money by doing that there that I can't make money doing on Earth. Capitalism is actually good for space. Um, in the future, almost certainly we'll be looking at primary and secondary structures, so key components of space stations, disposable clothing. Right now, astronauts don't wash very often, I'm told, uh, so the ability to print your own clothes, perhaps, could be highly desirable. Um, and also looking at things like medical consumables, so that's where we start looking at foods, pharmaceutics. Again, where additive plays a place, but uh, in effectively a completely different environment. Luna is also going to be demanding. Um, there's been a couple of quite interesting articles over the last week um, from the European Space Agency who are working with organizations like Foster and Partners to develop lunar habitat construction um, and effectively looking at how we can build habitats on Mars, um, sorry, on Mars, on the Moon, utilizing the regolith, the, uh, effectively the lunar-based soil. And that should be possible by using effectively large fused deposition 
um, tools in the same way we're using those on Earth to build concrete structures. Um, food manufacture and consumer oil replacement you can see as inherently being very key as well. Again, take what you need but maximize the utilization of what you have in such a way that you don't end up taking articles that you don't need. We're beginning to see that to an extent on the space station. There are a variety of now 3D printers from the maiden space, space platforms to some um, provisional metal platforms due to go up within the next couple of years. So the ability to manufacture what you need when you need it, again, is inherently quite key. Um, this image is from the European Space Agency and Fosters and Partners. Um, it's basically looking at a future um, lunar construction and already some of these um, prototypes are being trialled um, at the European Astronaut Centre in Cologne. And this is basically where you have a large inflatable dome. You inflate the dome so it gives you your protection, it gives you your space to occupy, it also means you can very quickly go into that space so you have a safe haven to go to. So being somewhere safe um, once you're on an, uh, effectively a lunar body or another planet is key then you want to do some other things. You want to protect from the great thermal um, gradient. So between night and day, certainly on the light side of the moon, compared to the dark side, the temperature, temperature variation is enormous. So to effectively improve that and improve the protection against radiation and also um, from um, any secondary impacts of meteorites, um, ESA are proposing that the robot on the right-hand side of the screen basically deposits quantities of regolith on top of the inflatable structure and then using a heated emitter effectively melts it in place. So effectively you are applying a almost brick-like structure over your inflatable former and that gives you the protection. The former gives you the airtight environment, the latter regolith being effectively placed over the top gives you your radiation protection, your impact protection and most importantly your thermal protection. Near-Earth objects, asteroid mining is clearly going to be one of those applications. Solar power stations may well be an application um, if any government on Earth is prepared to sign off beaming um, very, very um, high intensity, potentially death rays of um, radiation to somewhere on Earth and risk that they don't shift at night. Um, so clearly going to be some interesting areas there. But we are actually beginning to see some secondary structures in utilization right now. So for example, the Rosetta probe utilized um, a variety of different materials to reduce the impact um, of the um, spacecraft when it landed. And almost certainly um, in the near future for Mars sample return, depending on the outcome to an extent of ExoMars, um, somewhere around about 2024, 2025, a mission should go to Mars, collect a sample of Martian soil, then return that via a Martian ascent vehicle back to Earth. And one of the likely ways of capturing it um, is for effectively a capsule very much like that image in the center of the screen to be um, effectively um, dropped onto the surface of the earth. There will probably be parachutes but based on previous experiences of trying to capture return samples coming back from comets usually the helicopter misses capturing them and they hit the earth anyway. So instead of planning for the best, plan for the worst, assume that you're going to miss capturing your helicopter, it's going to hit the ground but your sample which at this point will probably be the most valuable substance on earth is actually protected from that impact. And then finally, we are beginning again, Made in Space is speculating about making very large structures um, where they can extrude solar sails using the FDM process. So we may well see some um, activity around there. This um, organization, fascinating company, um, based on the West Coast um, in the US, um, called Deep Space Industries. Um, they're proposing, and they're actually designing spacecraft right now to do this, to go and capture an asteroid. Um, I'm always slightly wary about asteroid capturing because um, bringing asteroids into the close proximity of the Earth to mine um, hasn't always worked out particularly well for pop populations on the planet. But assuming that they get the permission to do so, they intend to capture an asteroid, bring it into close proximity to the um, Earth, and then effectively mine the material. Now, when we talk about asteroid mining, most people will assume that we're talking about materials like platinum, gold and silver. Actually, those materials are completely useless. You can't do anything with them in space. They're broadly worthless in space while they may be invaluable on Earth. What you actually want, you want iron, you want titaniums, you want aluminiums, you want materials you can make structures out of. So Deep Space Industries are proposing that they will grapple an asteroid, bring it into a local Earth orbit, and then basically have on an in situ refinery where they extract material, and then they effectively 3D print structures, in this case, a torus, based on the resources that they are consuming 
from the asteroid. It's an interesting process. They've received reasonable um, venture capital funding, so clearly some people believe that they have potential, and if they manage to do that, they reduce the cost of lifting mass from the Earth to space, because we just must accumulate what we need in space to build the structures we want. Other planets, um, Foster's, Foster and Partners seem to be um, a, a reoccurring entity here, but they're also proposing inflatable constructs which you could potentially 3D print to um, place on Mars. And this basically is a very similar structure to the structure I um, talked about a moment ago on the Moon, where you would use the soil on Earth um, on, sorry, on Mars, you'd use the soil on Mars, you'd bake it, almost glassify it into a, uh, an external protective coating that you could put over an inflatable structure and again give you that protection from radiation, thermal gradients and micrometeorite impacts. This is a terrifying robot. Um, you might be able to see on the right hand side there's a um, small um, camper van and a guy walking towards this platform. And this is built by the German um, Institute for Artificial Intelligence and the German Space Agency. And it's a very different planetary explorer. So this is not in, on Mars, as you can probably tell. This is in, in the Utah desert last year. And this platform is, um, it runs off 150 watts, but it's the size of a small car. It's enormous and it's terrifying because it moves silently along like a giant spider. Um, it's got four legs, but it can do without one of those legs. And those legs are built, you can see the structures, they're very much topology optimized, built using a combination of carbon um, fiber based additive, some metal in there, some plastic, but a whole um, myriad of different techniques to build a really interesting structure. And this structure is actually one of the prototypes for this Martian sample return. The intention is that um, the claw on the top of it can extract samples from the ground and then the um, tiny little robot, which is actually underneath, you can see it looks like a series of kind of like wiry like wheels. It can place a sample on the top of that, and then that little rover can run back to the Martian ascent vehicle, which then take the sample and return to Earth. But it's, it's an intriguing design, and what was interesting was watching the engineers operate this, was that actually halfway through the trial, the robot lost a leg, but it continued quite happily without the leg. But because the part was partially made of carbon fiber, the engineers were able to effectively improvise a solo oven in the desert and manufacture a new part to fix the existing broken part, which I think bears um, very, very well for the future, where improvisation in remote environments, you don't have the ability to um, call your local supplier and say, can you, hey, can you FedEx me a spare part? If FedEx is back in Ohio and you're on, the, uh, um, on Mars, it's going to take a while. So improvisation and I think additive are two natural ingredients which go very, very well together. Again, another really interesting structure. This is by the Search Consortium, and this is the Mars Ice House. So this is where using one of the materials on Mars, which is abundant, which is actually water, um, tends to be at the polar caps of Mars rather than generally around the equator. So you have to be quite specific where you go. If you land in the wrong place, you're not going to be building an ice house. Um, but this is basically using fused deposition. Um, you can see the robot on the right-hand side of the screen and it's basically rotating around and round the um, inside of the structure, putting down layer and layer of ice. And one of the really attractive qualities of ice is, well, A, it's non-toxic, um, B, it's highly resistant to radiation. So for example, the radiation shelters on the International Space Station are surrounded by water. And the projection is that for future structures, which may well go beyond Earth, so potentially interplanetary or certainly to the inner planets to Mars, spacecraft will use water as the radiation shield. So if you want to, um, if there is a solar storm, a coronal mass ejection, and you need somewhere to hide from radiation, you would go inside um, effectively a giant water tank. So applying the same principle to a platform on Earth, effectively a building, make it out of water, the ice naturally acts as a barrier to shield that radiation from you. And at the same time, the thermal gradient um, offers you protection. But intriguingly, perhaps one of the greatest qualities is ice is really easy to make. It's really easy to freeze so if you have damage or you suddenly want to build an additional structure instead of as with the ESA lunar concept where you need your inflatable um, effectively former if you want to build something out of ice you just go and build another ice house so it would be inherently quite easy to effectively build um, ice house after ice house um, adjacent to each other naturally on the inside you're going to want to do something about insulation to an extent but if any of you have ever spent time in an igloo I'm sure someone in here probably has um, 
if you place a single candle on the inside of an igloo and block up the entrance, actually the internal temperature will, ra uh, will rise to a temperature which is sufficiently ambient for you to take off your um, outer um, ski wear or whatever you're wearing. So inherently, it can actually work very well. So it can be a very energy efficient way of building a structure using in situ material, using simple techniques, which I would envisage by the point we hit Mars, FDM should be maybe not an old technique, but certainly a very, very established technique. And then finally, going beyond Sol, so beyond our solar system. Um, I'm not gonna speculate too much on this because I think you can um, go into the realms of science fiction very easily. Um, but what I think is very clear is um, this ring is known as a Stanford Taurus. Um, it's a little bit like a giant halo or an orbital ring. It can go around a planet or it can be a giant orbital structure. It can have a diameter of potentially tens of meters or it could equally have a diameter of hundreds of kilometers, assuming you could build something like that. But to build something like that, I think it, we can safely assume that we don't have the planetary population probably large enough, certainly right now in space we have six, you'd need a, a population in space in the tens of thousands, which is unlikely to happen certainly in the near term. So if you want to build structures like this, then the only way we will be able to build structures like this will be with using a degree of high automation manufacture. And I suspect many of those techniques being utilized will be uh, comprise of techniques like fused deposition modeling, like um, selected, uh, like sintered um, metal manufacture, looking at ceramics, looking at other techniques which we may not be looking at right now. But to build large structures, I think the additive is inherently going to be key to that. And it will also offer us the capability in the same way that we are looking at planetary con constructs, the ability to incorporate a whole variety of different materials. And that is my final slide. Um, I would like to acknowledge the um, organizations I have um, borrowed imagery from or have been kind enough to allow me to use their um, information. And my contact details are in the upper right hand corner. Um, if you wish to contact me and I will conclude there and take questions. Thank you.